So welcome to another edition of the Influence Global podcast. Uh, really delighted to have a very special guest with me all the way from the other side of the pond and um, from Colorado, and that's Adam Rosso. And Adam is the uh, CEO and founder of RFZ, um, which is a, an analytics platform, am I right, for, uh, which I think is very relevant to the influencer space. So today's episode is going to be really a, a much greater deep dive in, in how brands and agencies can really measure the effectiveness of influencer campaigns uh, and, and other forms of advertising. So Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, not not a platform per se, Gordon, but uh, more of a, a measurement service um, that helps out with influencer marketing campaigns. So, right. Great. No, I'm happy to be here. Super. Lo and lovely to have you. Um, so um, before you got into um, founding the business, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. Well, first, I'm one of three co-founders. Um, I've uh, you know two partners, Gary Zucker and Jonathan Fuda, uh, who I've been working with for years. My background actually started in PR and integrated marketing uh, back in New York City. This is over 20 years ago. Uh, worked in that industry for quite a while. Uh, decided to move out to Colorado, kind of dragged my wife here, kicking and screaming. <laughs> um, yeah, she was not not super happy to be leaving New York, but uh, we've been here now for about 18 years, so she's getting used to it. Uh, started a online qualitative research firm um, with some other partners here called I Moderate, and we essentially did qualitative one on one, so mini chats. Um, with survey participants and respondents in the midst of a survey. Um, so really kind of hopped right into research. Uh, and then after a decade, maybe longer there, um, hooked up with these two partners who I had known from uh, my time in Colorado, actually worked with one of them quite frequently, um, and we started Group RFZ. And we really started it to kind of fill this gap that we saw um, in the measurement space around content marketing, mm. uh, because marketers at that time, and they still are, putting out all this amazing content meant to shift perceptions, educate consumers, right? All these kind of, I would call top of funnel objectives with all this content, whether it be blogs, content hubs, things like that. And they didn't seem to have a great way to <clears throat> measure it. Um, so, you know, you had your page views, you had your time on site, things of that nature, but it really wasn't, uh, you know, those statistics, those metrics weren't really helping them understand if that content was actually achieving their stated goals. Um, so that's kind of what we set out to do. Fast forward, um, you know, a couple of years after that, um, and some of our clients we were doing this measurement for around content said, hey, we're starting to get really into influencer marketing, and we're having the exact same issue. Um, and so today, I would say probably 85 to 90 percent of the work we do is around influencer marketing. We're still doing some content stuff, still doing some general social stuff. Um, some own social, um, but really organic and amplified um, influencer marketing campaigns is, is is where we're seeing the most work. Amazing. And one of the things that, I mean, we're now in almost like the attention economy, aren't we, Adam? It's, it's you know, how does your content really stand out? Um, and I, I know that I've read some research in the past that says influencer marketing is 11 times greater ROI than almost any other form of media. I always caveat right. that by saying, you know, when done well, i.e., you know, using the right influencers with the right type of content on the right type of platforms, <laughs> because there's all sorts of nuances that can vary that uh, hugely. But really get, love to get some some best practice tips from you about, um, you know, I, I guess a lot of this when it comes to um, the effectiveness of, of, of content is to start a B testing it, starting to really get a, a feel for what type of content is working. What's your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think the more you can test things, the better. Unfortunately, it's not always realistic and it's not always practical. So especially we've seen that with with influencers, right? So you're working with, you know, 10, 20 influencers, whatever it might be. Um, You're giving them some creative freedom to put out content, you know, on behalf of your brand. Um, You're not necessarily going to go ahead and test all those pieces of content, right? Um, Like you would maybe a a huge ad campaign where you have, you know, two or three kind of storyboards that you test beforehand, what have you. Um, So I think it's really important that on the back end that you know how those pieces, those influencers, that campaign performed, right? Uh, Because then you can make strategic decisions from there. So, you know, testing beforehand, pretty challenging, right? You have to do your homework, your due diligence, as you mentioned, picking the right influencers, um, you know, having a really tight, good creative brief that doesn't include 15, 20 different messages, right? It's important to stay focused. I think that's one of the keys to good influencer marketing, as it is with any form of marketing, really, right? Um, And then kind of measuring things on the back end so you know what to do for next time. Mm. And and so typically, what are those um, measurement criteria that you would uh, suggest? Let's just take a um, a new influencer. Uh, let's, let's take a brand that comes to you, a challenger brand, and says, "Like we we really want to launch our new perfume. We want to make sure that this amount of investment is going to work." What sort of yeah. metrics would you be advising them to consider doing? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question, um, and it really depends. So we're launching a new perfume. It really depends, kind of where in the funnel um the marketing funnel right the sales funnel where that campaign falls so if you are an e-commerce brand right and you're kind of launching this perfume and it's all about getting people to add that perfume to the cart um there's trackable links there's promo codes there's you know digital storefronts all that sort of stuff um where we come into play and where we see things as a little dicier from a measurement perspective has been if you're that same brand, you're launching that perfume and the goal is to really build awareness, right, for that new product or get across certain points of differentiation, certain benefits, uh, you know, it, it's got this fantastic new scent or it's a great value, um, you know, or it is, um you know, kind of a, a must have, or you're trying to make it a must have, what, whatever those kind of benefits or, or product or brand attributes are, you're trying to get those across, right, all the way down to, you know, getting in the consideration set, getting in purchase intent, you know, so kind of top and middle of the funnel, right? Mm. Those are notoriously tougher to track. So, you have your engagement rate, right? You have reach, you could have things like earn media value, kind of those standard metrics that have always been around. Um, But we would say, go a level deeper, right? If you really want to understand if that campaign boosted awareness or made people think and feel about that perfume or your brand a certain way and raise purchase intent, you really got to ask people that actually saw that campaign, right? Uh, and then measure it against kind of a control group. And, and that's where brand list studies really come in is, is helping clients uh, really align those metrics with their specific goals. So they understand that people who saw that campaign were 10% more aware um, that Brand X has launched a new perfume or 15% more likely to purchase it the next time they look for a new fragrance things of that nature yeah it's really really important what you say i mean what gets measured gets managed doesn't it quite frankly because just listening to that last statement that's an important point of perspective in reaching out to new 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 target prospective people isn't it um because they want to feel that they're not the first person to try this particular product. They want to know that other people have, have felt the same way. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, we live in a world now where we trust the opinions of people more than we do brands per se. And that's of course why influencer marketing is, has done so well. Um, and, and what about stuff like um, 
video content and dwell time and numbers of views because people you know what you want to try and establish is you know if somebody's doing a, a, a youtube tutorial uh for a product or alignment um for, with, the, with a brand you know the fact that somebody's spending 20 minutes of their time on this as opposed to 30 seconds in itself is a telling insight isn't it yeah it it, it is um and i i don't want to kind of bash or you know disparage the metrics that have been around for for quite a while right um obviously the more eyeballs on something generally the better so you know you have millions and millions of views that that's fantastic but you know what we've come across is that um you know marketers uh pr professionals digital professionals um they're often kind of taking those viewing numbers um those views that dwell time whatever that metric or those metrics might be and they're kind of jumping to conclusions right so mm -hmm. just because you had two three million views doesn't mean that that specific message that you wanted to get across uh came across right it doesn't necessarily mean that it is, uh, you know, a video that's going to increase sales in the future. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be more favorable to your brand. So I, I would just kind of take those metrics for for what they are. Um, you can definitely use that as kind of a proxy for, you know, boosted awareness and things of that nature. Um, but if you really want to figure out um how that video made people think feel and intend to act um we feel like you really have to ask them <laughs> yeah no you're right um that's why i think sentiment analysis is so important isn't it um i, I was going to ask you how important do you think uh are emojis uh on on posts and comments and stuff uh, because now we've got a whole plethora of these things and sometimes people won't write loads of comments but they might they might create an emoji um can you measure emoji can emojis yeah I, you can and I, I i do like the use of emojis i just think they're so easy um and can be still somewhat vague even though now you have tons and tons to choose from right um that again it really doesn't give you that complete story and i think sentiment analysis and kind of going through all those comments, um, you know, which has been around for a while, that, that's great. There's still some issues with sentiment analysis with noise and, and not capturing kind of the absolute meaning and, and things of that nature. But um, I definitely think that's, you know, can be a good way to go, um, especially on social, right? Um, when you've got a ton of commentary to look through. Um, but uh, yeah, the use of emojis, it can just be a little vague and just often too easy for the user, right? It, it's kind of like that light or, it's you lazy, know, it? uh, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it, yeah. So I, I wouldn't necessarily rely on that if you're really trying to figure out, should I be using this influencer again? Uh, is this person really getting the message across? Um, is this where I invest my money? Are you really going to rely on? emojis to kind of <laughs> guide no, no, and, and you're absolutely right of course it's just it's just one of i mean you, the reason i mention it is because you can have you know analysis paralysis <laughs> um where there's you almost can. so many things to measure um in fact i wrote about it in 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 my book uh have, having done a lot of research i thought my god look look what you can actually measure just on a on a video um and uh because I think marketeers have got so much data. Sometimes it's not um, it's not the data points. It's the it, the the understanding and what you can do with that data that's the powerful tool. And I guess that's where people like you come in to help them them uh, first and foremost set the right goals in the first place, but also help them analyze what to do next. Yeah, and and you know when we first talk with our clients, the first thing we want to understand is tell us all about this campaign, exactly what you want from it, what you expect from it. Um, and there are times when we'll say we are not the right person to help you um, because your goals are lower in the funnel, or 
um, the investment um, doesn't necessarily warrant this type of research because at the end of the day, it's it's dollars and cents, right? Cool. Um, you're not going to spend half of your budget on the research aspect of it, or you know they'll have to kind of you know bend the campaign to accommodate the research, which is not something we ever recommend. Um, so you know it, it it there is a ton you can do. But when you really step back and say, okay, what is this campaign about? Um, what is the message I'm trying to get across? And then kind of set your measurement goals to align with the specific goals of the campaign. I think you can quickly take out a lot of these different measurement solutions or these standard metrics because you know they definitely tell you something, but do they tell you the story that is applicable to the campaign or are they just making things kind of messy? Um, so it, it's really important for our clients to hone in on what are those three kind of KPIs that you really care about? Um, and let's see if, you know, brand lift, which is where we really specialize um, is applicable for that or whether there's a better solution or something else out there that might really be helpful. That's really helpful. I mean, just just um, as a as a broad brush, if somebody had like a hundred thousand dollars for a campaign, what sort of allocation of that should they um, allow for research versus influencers and ads and everything else? Just as a, I know you could say it depends on so many things, but just as a broad brush. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, I usually say around. Five percent, I would say, you know, maybe ten percent at the highest um, is where we kind of typically see things. Um, I, I also think it depends where in their life cycle they are. So if you are just starting out with influencer marketing um, and you don't know whether you should be on uh, Instagram, if you should be exploring TikTok, you don't know what type of influencers to use. Um, what messages will be, you know, uh, best uh, and come across, um, you know, whether it's an educational message or kind of a, a, a message that's more humorous. I think it's probably better in the beginning to spend more money to do kind of tests and learns, which mm -hmm. we often do for our clients. So, you know, you're going to spend more money up front. But hopefully at the end of the day, you're going to figure out quickly that uh, you're probably better off in most cases using micro influencers. Um, you're better focusing on TikTok, um, you know, things of that nature. So it, it can definitely depend. But yeah, at the end of the day, we don't see people spending, you know, 20, 30 percent of their total campaign budget on research. It just doesn't make sense, frankly. No, and that's good to hear, um, because I think for some people watching and listening to this, they may not know. So it's good to get your sort of benchmark on that. Um, what about campaigns that are that have flopped? Um, you know, no doubt you've you've probably worked with campaigns, you've analysed them, but that for some reason they haven't worked. But um, I guess the other big benefit is, is that that's where the research can do its job as well. Well, the reason it didn't do its job is because this didn't happen or that didn't happen. So uh, right. uh, tell us a little bit about um, how, what to do with a campaign that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would say the thing to do is definitely to have that research, to have that complete story, um, which I think where brand lift kind of really helps because you're using surveys, right? You're looking at a control exposed, um, you know, uh, kind of research approach and, getting insights from those audiences um, and and then to change, right? Don't keep making the same mistake over and over again. Um, and, and, you know, some of the biggest mistakes that we typically see, it, it's really interesting. It's, uh, I would say that the number one mistake is um, really not being overt about mentioning kind of the brand or the product. Um, some marketers and some creators are trying to be maybe, I don't want to say too artsy, um, <laughs> but they're trying too hard to not make it look like an ad. It winds up coming off as obscure. Maybe the brand isn't mentioned or maybe it's just in the caption um, and a lot of consumers walk away 
not knowing who that content was even for, right? Um, who is the brand behind it? Uh, consumers are smart. Um, they understand what influencer marketing is. Um, there are certain expectations. They want to hear from the people who they are following what brands, what products they really, really like. Um, so kind of give that to them, right? Um, so I would say that, you know, that's probably the biggest mistake we see with, with influencer today is trying to get, I would almost say too cutesy um, and kind of dance around that this is in fact for a specific brand, a specific product. Good points. And and what about, um, are you measuring those that are using the proper disclosures as well? Like for example, hashtag ads or or hashtag adver, advert or advertisement, all of those things, because there are some brands and influencers who wrongly uh, choose not to disclose those things because they feel it affects their engagement. Um, what's your view on that? I think it's it comes back to bite them <laughs> at the end of the day. It might not happen right away, but you've got to be transparent. Uh, with consumers. There's just too much at stake. Um, it is an ad. You are paying someone. Um, it's a transaction <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, cool. Money exchanges hands or product exchanges hands. Um, I, I feel like you've got to be open and honest with it. All the brands that we work with um, are you know, very kind of dialed into that and, and make sure that, you know, all those hashtags and, and that's all followed properly. And I would say those are that are not, um, you might get away with it on a campaign or two, um, but I, I don't think kind of the juice is worth the squeeze there, right? <laughs> I don't think it's, it's, <laughs> it's worth it to try and kind of pull the wool over consumers' eyes. Yeah. Do you measure um, hashtags at all? No, we, we don't really focus on hashtags so much. Um, you know, what we do, and to give maybe just a quick 101 on, on brand list, which is really where we focus, is, um, you know, we sit down with a customer, understand what their specific goals and objectives are, um, and then we will essentially launch a control exposed research program where we are going to use an online survey, uh, get insights from people that we know saw the content, possibly they're following the influencer, um, and also a control group, which is essentially a lookalike group. Uh, mm -hmm. Same from a demographic, psychographic perspective as the exposed group. Um, and by giving both those groups the exact same survey, um, you kind of look at the deltas, right, the differences, and, and kind of understand that um, you know, the list that the campaign achieved or that a certain piece of content achieved or a certain group of influencers achieved. So what we're typically measuring um, are things up and down the funnel, uh, stopping short of that conversion, that kind of add to cart visit to a website. So things like um, listing aided awareness or unaided awareness or both, um, familiarity of a brand or a product, favorability, um, consideration set, purchase intent, um, you know, affinity, and, and going into the messages too. So, um, you know, did this campaign for Cadillac make people think that, uh, you know, that, that Cadillac is a, a luxury brand or a modern brand? Um, did this campaign for Kraft uh, make people feel like it, it makes parents' lives easier? Um, when they're trying to feed their kids in the middle of a busy day. Um, so it's really kind of all those awareness, favorability, purchase metrics, right? Purchase intent metrics, um, and then really kind of honing in on those messaging points and those brand or product attributes. And that's hugely valuable for a brand because it could even change their positioning statements and the way in which they communicate with influencers as well based upon that right. uh, I always say sometimes the very first influencer campaign may not be your most successful um, but the second and third one may well be um, because you you do you do learn from you do learn from things um, and also collaborating with influencers to help you create the content rather than being so prescriptive 
and where brands create that real true collaboration you you can often see great magic happening can't you yeah you you absolutely can and it's funny we have the benefit of seeing um you know creative briefs that are super super prescriptive and they're pages and pages and pages long wow. um and then we kind of see the the opposite too um and, and i definitely think you have to give uh creators and influencers some sort of guideline but yeah when you when you really try and kind of pigeonhole them and put them in this tiny creative box um that doesn't work so well either. Um, and and w once they get to know your brand, what we're seeing a lot is brands using the same influencers over and over again, right? Having that ongoing relationship, um, then they really get a sense for who your brand is, you know, what you're trying to do, what you stand for, your values. Um, and then oftentimes they can just kind of go off, you know, three bullet points. Um, and, and that's when I think kind of, influencer marketing becomes really really interesting when you start to have those ambassadors and those those spokespeople Absolutely. and again they, they don't need to be celebrities right no. um they can be um you know micro influencers nano influencers um everyday parents things of that nature so well also the the more the influencer content is being exposed to their audience on a regular basis as opposed to a single post they're more likely to be engaged and consumed, so they'll get greater and great engagement uh, for the for the brand and influencer alike, and so that the the influencer and brand will see will almost be entwined. In fact, that's probably why we get a lot of clothing brands, um, you know, like Nike Ambassadors or you know all, all of that sort of stuff, where it's a ah, you know, it's a it's they're they're a key person in the Nike business, you know. So yeah, it's really fascinating. Yep. Good stuff. Well, Adam, it's been a pleasure talking to you. How can people find out more about um, how to find you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, our website is www.grouprfz.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, probably too much. Um, <laughs> so you can kind of <laughs> hit me up there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely around. Um, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate it. No, thank you, Adam. And all the best for the future. Thank you, you as well.